And now uh, I'm very happy that, that Max agreed to give the second part uh, of his talk from last week on quantum mechanics. And yeah, enjoy. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. Thank you all for coming. So uh, first, I want to start off with a quick recap from last week. I know the discussions were a bit long, so I thought we all need a reminder. So what was the main thing what we did last week? We introduced um, the inner product. in a complex vector space. So denote this with CM. So let's look how this works again. Let X and Y be two complex vectors. Let me write down the inner product written in this notation here is nothing more than taking the complex conjugate of the vector and transpose it and matrix multiply it with the second argument, y. So this looks like the following. We transpose the first argument. Of, so this is the first uh, so this is the, uh, the first number in the vector. And we add this together. We do the same thing for the second, second number and so on until we've reached the nth numbers. To write this in a shorthand notation, you can simply write this as a sum from i equals one to the number of dimensions we have, x i times y i. Okay, so that's something <clears throat> pretty concrete. And we also introduced the metric, the Euclidean or the Euclidean distance Uh, or length of a vector. By saying that this expression here of a vector with x in c to the power n again, is nothing more than the scalar product of the vector with itself and take the square root of it. So writing that down again, we complex conjugate the first argument with itself, take it in the product with itself and so on. Take the square root of it. And if you wish to, this is nothing more than the absolute square of a complex number. Yes. And if you write it down in uh, shorthand notation, this is nothing more than taking the square root and sum all the components of the vector up in the absolute square. So, Just an X, so an X as an example of an inner product in the finite dimensional space. And we also introduced some uh, special kind of matrices. So let X and Y be again like some complex vectors, and A be a square matrix living in the n cross n matrix space. 
So if you remember, if you want to evaluate an expression like this here, where we write the matrix in the first argument, this is nothing more than taking the complex conjugate of this expression and transpose it. And matrix multiply it with y. So remembering that transposing this expression here results in a change of the um, in a, a change of the uh, direct, uh, in a change of the direction of the arguments. Um, we'll take, we we'll transpose both arguments and take the complex conjugate of it and multiply with y. And this expression here, the A complex conjugated and transposed is called the conjugate transpose, often denoted in physics notation with a dagger. Please complain if my handwriting is somehow not readable or not unique. Um, okay, and now we introduced two special cases. First of all, if the conjugate transpose of a matrix is the matrix itself, we call it a Hermitian matrix. And if the conjugate transpose of a matrix is the inverse of itself, this is called a unitary matrix. matrix. Um, so that you guys remember those two types of matrices, or later we will generalize this to operators again will become important. So what we also did the last time is um, that functions behave similar to vectors in some sense. So quick, like a quick sketch of this. Let's take like, let's assume that this set here denotes the complex vector space and let's have a subset in it, which we shall call omega. And on this omega, there are, there are functions, there live functions which map to the complex numbers, which often are noted in a two-dimensional coordinate system with the real part and its imaginary part. And mode and um, what we introduced there was our so-called LP spaces. So if we recap this, the LP space over some set omega, and the omega is pretty general. It's nothing more than all the functions mapping from omega to the complex numbers, which fulfill the condition that their integral, if we integrate over this set omega to the power p is smaller or like does not diverge where x is an element from this subset omega. Great.
Let's have to write down, okay. And uh, one important case, especially, is the L2 space. Okay. Any questions so far? Remember? Okay, great. Um, we introduced the inner product in L2. So this just denotes that it's a subset of complex, uh, some complex vector space. So the inner product, so um, let U and V the elements, the functions living in this L2 space. And we write down that the inner product taken here is nothing more than the integral over the set omega taking the complex conjugate of the first argument times the second argument and integrate it up. So, excuse me, I have a question on the first line. You say uh, L squared, and then in the bracket you have omega, and then the C. Uh, this is uh, supposed to denote a subset. So that it's that omega is okay. a subset. Okay, of. it's not element of, and you forgot no. the bar. No. Okay, you mean subset, subset here. Subset, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. And we saw that um, there are striking similarities. between um, finite dimensional spaces and the LP spaces. For instance, in finite dimensions, we have linear mappings called matrices. And in our LP spaces, the same thing that corresponds to it is, for instance, uh, is a linear operator. An example for this is taking derivative or for instance the Laplace operator which is the sum of taking the second partial derivative for all coordinates which you have here for instance in three-dimensional Okay. You don't have to note on everything. I will get up a PDF of the notes. So if you would like to listen, it's, it's fine. You won't miss anything, you won't miss out on anything. Okay. All right. Great. So um, I wanted to give you now an example and something I haven't talked about yet, which were also normal bases, because we talked about them last time a lot, and I wanted to give you an example. So let's get back to a space which we know, the three-dimensional R, R3. 
and we call a base um, orthonormal if it fulfills so let's the set this is sloppy notation Uwe, by the way <laughs> um, let's get a finite base out of some vectors and if we take the inner product between two of the vectors which differ on the same vector we get zero i is not equal to j so if you take two different vectors out of this base set and take the inner product between them they go down to stay they're zero in r3 in r they are just like orthogonal to each other and if we take the same vector in the in, into the inner product with itself We get one. And um, shorthand physics notation says the following taking two vec taking two of those vectors with one index EI J equals this symbol delta i j <laughs> <laughs> <No. laughs> yeah <laughs> this is so dirty and wrong what you're doing there <laughs> <laughs> okay um this is the called the uh, chronica delta you're not that's fine i'm okay. fine if you write it in r3 it's totally bonkers but it's fine <laughs> and we define this as i'm just trying to introduce the notation so because it often appears in physics texts so that you're this is very suggestive equals one if I equals J and zero on the other times. So if both indices have are the same, it's one, otherwise it's zero. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And those orthonormal bases are very, very useful because um we can in finite dimension in r3 the um, uh, inner product between two vectors um, can be interpreted as the uh, um, uh, can uh, can be interpreted as the projection from one vector to the other. Um, let me draw a quick figure up there. Let's take two vectors. Mm -hmm. And the, the value of the uh, oh, sorry. inner product. is 
the length somehow the vector has as a component from the other vector. And we should keep this idea in mind because it's very useful later. Um, I don't know. Um, do you want an X? So with an orthonormal basis, we can easily change. We can easily change um, basis of vectors by um, by simply um, taking the by keeping this by keeping this idea in mind. Um, if we have a, for instance, the unit base and another base, uh, vector can always be represented. Um, using the inner product, you now like you know, it's three dimensional space. Uh, in three dimensional space, we can always get a vector in an alternate base. Um, Representation where v1, v2, v3 are base uh, base vectors, orthonormal base vectors. In this way, by just taking the inner product, so that we get an idea how much uh, v1 is in b, for instance, and then take v. You might remember the role of the scalar product that just gives a projection. Yeah. It's, do you remember your scalar product? <laughs> yeah, sure, I can in a while. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Sorry, I don't really get why. Um, so, for example, we we one in the first line yeah. needs to be one. So that B is the B, right? The sum of all of them. Yes. I have an example prepared. Okay. I can Maybe you use. write down what B actually is in an orthonormal uh, basis again yeah. down there. B is nothing more. So if we have some, uh, so we have something like B1, B2, B3. It's nothing more than a notation for B1 times like a first base vector times B2, second base vector. <coughs> Look at your notation. Oh. No, that's fine. Oh, what, are, what are your coefficients? Are they B or B? In this case, B, mm -hmm. because this is the, because I call this the unit base here, mm -hmm. in this case. So why does it show up? So um, B, in this case, is uh, meant to be in the uh, as a representation of the unit base. Thank you for for saying that. So if we have we all, this representation is always depending on the base you choose. In this case, I chose the unit base. And if I want to um, if I want to represent B in the V base. In this case, so uh, these numbers in the uh, in the uh, vector would simply be the inner product. These coefficients before the uh, unit uh, before the base vectors. Yeah, so this would be the V representation in the V base. So I'm having troubles following. So okay. okay. So I learned about this before. Yeah. So I have a guess on where you want to head. Yeah. But I have absolutely no clue <laughs> what we're okay. trying to do now. Okay. So, so I have a couple of troubles. Like B here, B is a is a vector of real values, is it? 
Yes. Poisonous yes, sense of just, vectors. Now, just a real value vector. Because you, you, you constantly use the word a base. For me, a base is a set of vectors. It's a set yeah, of a base is a set of, set of vectors. Yeah. So B is not a base here. B is not a base here. B is simply a vector. Hmm? Is it a coordinate? It's a co it's a simpler coordinate vector, like okay. like one like like the vector one two three expressed in a base like the unit base, like one where you have the base vectors one zero zero. What is the unit base? Oh uh, yeah. And then I know it's standard. The, the, the short the short common. Um, I think the B in these uh, first couple of lines is some kind of an abstract uh, representation of a point in a space like in a real space, uh, for example, which is called a vector because of its properties. But when you put it in the base, like in these big brackets in the, down there, then you need to choose a base to have a representation with numbers of these abstract vector. Uh, vector. And this is what he did, uh, did here. And a unit base is just a case of a base where uh, every component is zero except the component, uh, okay. except one component. Then I know this is a standard base. Yes, okay. it's a canonical, a canonical base. Also. Okay. Like, like the one zero zero zero. Okay, one, zero, okay. Zero, zero, but, zero. but there's a difference between the abstract vector, like in a point there, and the representation in a base. Okay. These are two different you things. Like the two. With us? Yes, I am. Yeah, like like the two sides of the equation. Machine learning person. And, no. and you also, when you said a unit base, you're also referring to an orthonormal base. Yes. No, no, the unit base is the base with the one in one position. Which are orthonormal. Them. Yes, which are always orthonormal. Yeah. So this is just a nice thing about orthonormal bases. Okay. Because you can easily change representation between them. <laughs> from a vector. Or the so, <laughs> because we know how this here works, like the inner product works, and we simply have to take the inner product in one representation, and uh, then click, see, easily get the coefficients to get the other representation. So you can easily switch between bases. That's nice. It's, it's, uh, I know this is a change of base, yeah. <laughs> but I can't see that here. Okay, um, I have a. But don't worry too much. I have a really, I have an explicit example here, which I could present to you later. Hmm? Maybe because uh, I have a further question. Uh, where you explain the projection, uh, here you project the V on U. Yeah. And uh, the inner product is commutative, is it? Yes. Oh, uh, you mean uh, by changing the? Can I change V and U, and it's the same thing? It's uh, it's not it's not because you have to uh, complex conjugate. But here we are. R three R three it's it's R three it's fine. So that means the projection of V on U and the projection of U and V should be the same length. Yes. But, time, but times okay. the vector. But times the vector. So there it's V times U. Oh, the inner product of V and U times U. And the other project, uh, auto projection is uh, oh, the uh, 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 vector v. So this is the two different lengths. I'm yeah. trying to understand what he drew here. So he projected v on u, and he says this is the length of the inner product. The green line, yes. Yes. So if we project, if we project u on v, it's what the length of u v this, inner product, which yeah. should be the same yes. in R3. Yes. Yes. The, that length is same. But if you look at the vector, then v dot u is like it's along u, and the other one is along v. So direction. I know, I know. The direction is different, but, but this is the scalar, not a vector. This is scalar, yes. Yeah. Scalar. So this is just uh, uh, just should you uh, this is just a represent so this green line just should represent the length in the. Yeah, I'm just asking myself because I remember we always had to normalize the vector on which we are projecting on. And you didn't mention that, so I was wondering if we need to do that or not. Good, because he's working with orthonormal basis. We are in an orthonormal basis. So, so, you so V and U are orthonormal? No, they are not orthonormal with each other. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the projection would be zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. But are U and V of length one? Um, I would just, uh, okay. No, in this case, not. Mm -hmm. You can. It's 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 a general. So you and V are any vector. Can be yeah, can be any vector. But then you need to multiply the scalar product with the length of U. 
to get these lengths, which... This is what I'm asking. Okay, uh, yeah. okay, okay. To, 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 to So the length, the, the, the green line is actually VU times the magnitude of U. It's more, it's more like the yeah. proportion uh, of the length of U. Mm -hmm. Three, six. Yes, something like that. Ah, now we're talking. Yes. So that's the length of the green piece here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the okay. Yeah. And the same for another one. For this exactly. Yeah. Now it explains why if you would project U onto V, it would be a yeah. different length. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, I just want to give you. Um, Example for like now an L space, and for this case we cons shall consider um, the L two on a finite interval of minus pi and pi, and Explicit form um, all the functions mapping from minus pi to pi to C. Why is pi coming up here? <laughs> <laughs> Getting hungry. <laughs> this is just definition inserted for the interval interval we choose. And um, <clears throat> wasn't there a smaller infinity somewhere? Uh, no. Yes. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry. Right. So all functions that don't diverge if you integrate them over this interval. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to. Sh I want to show you a base, an orthonormal base, on this um, interval. Does anybody know a function that does not have this property? Could define a function that maps every input to zero. You could also have like diverging functions, for instance, yeah. that diverge and have a infinite large integral at some point. <laughs> I can, for example, think of the tension function. What is in there is, for instance, everything like a sine, a cosine, or everything that does not really diverge in this interval, we need to get over it. Every continuous function. And are continuous, yes. Uh, <laughs> tangent diverges is at minus pi and pi. OK, this is so far away from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe you. <laughs> I actually tried to, to Google tangents, so I'm not sure why these big things all fall flat. Because of 10. I have no idea. Okay. This is, you see here. Mm -hmm. You mean the, the transcendental function? I figured you were talking about the tangent. Yes. It is a tension. And the tangente. Yeah, tangent. Ten. ten. Of x equals 10 of x. Okay, so we're talking about the tangents, not a tangent. Because you could have a function that computes tangents to, I don't know, points no. or something. So this is one that's not in L, that one. Okay. Yeah, so because you have a closed boundary integral. Mm -hmm. Sorry, to think about it.
Oh, you're checking. <laughs> okay. Very well. <laughs> it's very good. I have to be very careful with my words today. That's good. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's show that this. Oh, I'm true. There's not I don't know. I don't have the limits. I don't have the limits in my head at the moment, so I don't know. <laughs> um, am I right or am I wrong? Just a second. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. We'll just. Uh, hey, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, this okay. We will now show that this set of functions here, this set of functions where we have e to the minus i n x, where x is uh, it's just a number from minus pi to pi, and n is a whole is a whole number, or like or can even um, is that a function? That's a term. It's a function. Like you can have f out of x equals one over two pi. Okay. That just gives you a complex number in the end. Wait, like, that's and, and what's like you, you write e? Is it to the power of minus? Is it a capital T or it's a I it's a I it's an imaginary number. It's an imaginary number. Okay. Why are you doing the why does it have a, a line on top? Oh um that's just it's because the, the stylus is hard to handle for dots. Um okay, so it's a dot. So it's not a conjugate of I. Oh no, it's not a conjugate, it's okay. simply a dot. I I'll try to make my dots more clear. Sorry. Like this it's minus I and X. Uh, yeah. The mapping of X to T. Um, so we have like a set of basis functions. I'm going to show you that it's an orthonormal base right, right now, which we can count because this index here is a natural number. We can even do it as a whole number. Um, um, we should do that actually. So take this as the whole as the whole number. It can be minus five, plus five, whatever. So let's take an ins let's take for instance the uh, let's show that this is an orthonormal base indeed by simply computing first the what we have to do for this is computing the um, the inner product between two of those base vectors. So we have now an N and an and a a M. N and an M, yeah. I can't, oh. cannot do this very easily with a mask. M. <laughs> okay. Write this down as per definition, simply plugging it in there. So we have E taking the complex conjugate. Okay. This is just using the definition. Where is the absolute square going to? This is the inner product. We don't do the absolute. You yeah, simply did the. This is just the. Yeah. Okay. So, and um, we can. So, oh, somebody's uh, saying something in the chat. One over. Oh, eight. Damn it! Yeah. Yes, <laughs> should have thought about that. But not over minus pi to pi it is, Adila. It is right. It is one, one over x is. Or is, uh, yeah, 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 yeah
I apologize, I do not. There's a zero between minus pi and pi. <laughs> okay. Damn it. Okay, um, let's consider now. Uh, so we're now solving. <laughs> so let's now solve this this year for two cases. First of all, we're going to take the easy the easy way and set n equal to m. Yeah. So then we have this here equals <clears throat> one over two pi. <clears throat> To pi. X. So this here is zero. And e to the power zero is always one. So we just have here one over two pi. Minus pi to pi, one dx. This expression here evaluates to two pi, two pi equals one. So, great. <laughs> 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 now, and now for the tricky bit. <laughs> Ooh. This is a real nice whiteboard software. I love it. Uh, now take n and equal to m. Then we have um, one over two pi. Pi to pi X. Right. We have this expression here. Continuing on. So just plugging in the um, the base uh, the integral function of this gives us the following expression. Don't like it? No, I would love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me really insecure here. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so how do we evaluate this thing? First of all, we know that n minus m evaluates to some uh, whole number. Let's just call it k. Again, we have something like 1 over 2 pi i k k pi oh somebody's having objects in the chat <laughs> okay. So um, I don't know if you know the complex um, definition of the sine function. No. Any chance? 
Okay, we can write the sine out of x as one over two i e to the power x plus e to the power minus x. E uh, e i yes, thank you. Great. Um, uh, minus also in between. Yeah. Plus that would be the cosine. Oh. The cosine. Oh. And now look at this here. We have the two. We have the i. And we have something e to the power i k something i i i something. So we just simply use this definition now and end up with e to the power k sine out of k times pi, where k is a whole number. And if we know something about the sine function is that it's zero at whole numbers at whole numbers of pi multiplied by pi. So this here evaluates indeed zero. Yay. <laughs> Great. So this is an orthonormal base now. Is, did that become clear? In, any questions to that? So I need to roll up this now in my head. You, said, you just said now this becomes an orthonormal base. It's, what, it's, what is this? It's, uh, these set of functions e to the i n x e to the minus power minus i n x over 2 pi, where you take this n out of the whole numbers. All of those functions which you have here is the base, is a base, orthonormal base on this interval. We have, we have infinitely many base vectors. Each denoted by one n. In what space are we again here? In this L2. Right, you said we are in R3. Yeah, I, I just said that we should consider the L2. That's L2 here. L2 uh, on the interval of minus pi to pi. Okay. What is that again? That's the all functions that it's map from minus pi to pi. Really? And this is pi in, in, in the real space? Yes. Okay. Okay, that maps real space to complex space. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we are what computing a set of function that maps reals to complex. Yes. 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 It doesn't diverge. It doesn't diverge. And doesn't diverge. Yeah. When you integrate over it. So how many elements does this 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 space have? Infinitely. Infinitely many. So we are in an infinite space now. Yes. Okay, I did, I didn't guess that. So so. And to have an infinite space, you also need, of course, uh, so um, the basis set which we have here uh -huh. has also infinite amount of elements because this n is simply taken out of the whole numbers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we just showed in general that it's fulfilling the uh, uh, the axioms for an orthonormal base by showing that taking the scalar product of two base vectors, if they are the same, they evaluate to one. And if they are different, they evaluate to zero. Yes. Okay. So your scalar product is good, and those elements of the, of the base they fulfill the requirements for an orthonormal base. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Yes. So I hope you can think you, about you did, you did not really show that they are part of L2. It's Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Believe me that. Okay. <laughs> Any I'm believing you 95. <laughs> okay. Um, and you don't show that this is a complete set. Yeah, that's a complete set. So two mathematical rigorously things, but showing that it's a complete set is very hard. Yeah. And what so is you a would complete set? you would have to show that this space actually can represent all the functions living on L2. On this L2 space. Which we just looked at, so that you can ah. really represent any function with it, and this is really really hard. Yeah. And usually, <laughs> just yeah, swept under the rug in most physics. <laughs> we just don't have time for that here. Yeah. Nobody can tell. Don't you also need to prove linear independence of the base vectors? Uh, this is a. Uh, or is thing which problem? follows from the from the so or that, that follows from the scalar from the uh, it follows ah. that they are linear independent but uh, you need to show that 
they can represent every function L2 from minus one to five. Because you have to define L2 as that vector space, and if there is one function in there that cannot be represented as a linear combination of these basis functions, then, then, the, then the base is obviously. Then it's not the base. Okay, okay. So now let's take a function f, f which lives on this L2 space. And now let's do the same thing which we just denoted in uh, in R three, where we just we project on something. We project on something. Yes. So we should call but whatever that means. Whatever that means. Like Sorry. don't don't think about it too hard. <laughs> 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 just yeah. Vectors work geometrically in my head. So if I cannot draw yes, this. I'm trying to draw a picture of that in my head. No, geometry is not about drawing. Drawing is just a representation of geometry. Exactly. If I can't represent it, it's quite hard for me to understand. I can show you videos with different uh, matrices. I just had a very nice video where you are living in a non Euclidean East, uh, space with rendering and everything. I've, I've seen videos and people like doing a game engine with this. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's fun. <laughs> it's fun. And now it's now we can we can do the, the thing I wanted to show you is representing this function in the base in our orthonormal base set. Remember that n was an element of z, not of n. Yeah, from minus all the minus numbers. For, uh, integral numbers and all the plus integral numbers, not just from zero to not just zero, one, two, three, but really minus five, minus seven, minus ten, fifty six. So you could have also written sigma and n element of c. Yeah. Okay, that's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now we can suddenly represent any function living on this space here by this uh, series here. Because the last term are the are our base vectors again. Let me write that down like we did before in in um, in a product. Yeah, in a product. In a product. So um, and we go from minus infinity to infinity because we have to get all our uh, base vectors into the sum. Now let's just call to 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 really put a the uh, end to it. Let's just call this um, let's just denote that um, with this with this notation. Just call it as an en, like an unit vector. Instead, in front of the bar. Uh, no, that's just again a uh, dot, my i dot. Okay, dot. here's the quotation, but, but the bar of the fraction to the left, there's like two little pieces. So it's like quotation marks. Like exactly. I just want to, I want just to make quotation marks. Define is usually yeah. three or yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, let's, let's just define this. I uh, just wanted to, so that it's a bit of to the left, to the left, we have a set. Okay. Oh, oh, this one, this was just a quote. Quote with yeah. quotation marks, yeah, yeah. Without an end quote. Hello. Yeah, so, uh, it's a singular quote. No, no. It wasn't an end quote. It wasn't an end quote. It was two quotes. I, I, it doesn't matter. Okay. Like, just, <laughs> just, just, it's like, it's like if you're going to the barber, but it has two quotation marks, and then you don't really get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see this. <laughs> really fresh meat, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we just 
can, so if you introduce this shorthand notation, this is just notation. This doesn't change anything in what we are doing here. We just taking the infinite sum of the inner product of our function living on f uh, on the L2 space with one of the base vectors. I multiply it by one of the base vectors. That's the same thing you do in R3, but we just saw in R3. And that's the nice thing, because this is a uh, discrete Fourier series. <gasps> now, oh, wait, what? You have been working through this corona and a half hours. You should have written down the discrete Fourier series first. <laughs> And then say just this remember, <laughs> just this remind you of anything. So, so let's go back. <laughs> so, 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 so F, F is an element of, of L2. That, that's fine. It's a function. Then you define a F, F, and with a tilde on top. Yes. As that inner product. Yeah. I, I interpret this as a coordinate on yes. one of, like, like one component of exactly. the coordinate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then you say F on X is like, the sum of all those coordinates times the base vector. You say like it's a linear combination of the base. Yes. Vector. What, what is Fn as a as a is it a function or is it what is it? It's a scalar. Exactly. It's just a number. Yeah. That's okay. The, so it's the length. So we call it f because f is not used for functions in math. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> <laughs> no could, we, we, he uses a tilde to, to say that's a number. Okay. You can use something else as well. You could also call it just C to say it's a concept. Or coordinate or whatever. Or coordinate or whatever. Okay. okay, you say this is a linear combination of those things. Yeah. Then what you expand that a little, what happened? What? Yeah. Um, is, is it the same thing? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, yeah this is the same. He can copy paste. He can, I can copy. I wasn't paste. sure. Maybe he just. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no. All good. It's just on a new page. So this here. Is can wait again. No, 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 I don't get it. Because on the first line, wouldn't you need an inner product here? Yes, but this is just a. This here is the shorthand notation for this inner product. Here. That's the scalar you get from the inner product. Possession tool. We just defined that before. Go, go, go. Ah, okay, okay. You expanded FN here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. My memory is very short. Yeah. Good. So you expanded that here. Yeah. And then you introduced an alias for for this base vector. Yes. And now it looks nicer. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now it reminds you a lot of R three. Yeah. Yeah. But the real the real power in this, or the real fun in this, is the one before the easy nice notation. Yeah. Okay, um, but this so the where you still keep the inner product. Yeah. So or where you still yeah. keep the FNs. Yeah. So we this he, he totally burnt his job. You have to work on your <laughs> 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 So then you mentioned something with the discrete Fourier series or yes. something, which is something I have no clue what that is. Okay. It's more than that. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> this is the discrete Fourier series. I don't have to. Now this is not the. It's an instance of it, is it? It's like yes. one this interval. Of it. Yes. It's. It's an instance of it. Yes. Okay. I mean, we can all just leave it on the side and I accept it. <laughs> if you, you want. This one is called Fourier or Fourier discrete Fourier transformation. Discrete Fourier transformation. If you have like an instance transformation, theory. not a function. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it trans, it trans, um, so those coefficients. It's the discrete Fourier function series transformation. Series. Come on, maybe. Series. Maybe series. you should ex explain what a discrete Fourier yeah. transformation. So if you have a this, so if you have a signal, I I just I have a signal. Yeah. So like beep, some beep, 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 some. Um, like yes, yeah, like a sine function or something like that. Like, okay. Like a function. I don't take this sign. Okay. Many coefficients. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine you have like some curve that has like some periodic behavior, and okay. This is like noise. But it needs to. Have, it needs to be periodic. No. Okay. But so can take any function. Too. 
It needs to be in this L2, yes. Between minus okay. plus F. Which, which we can draw and I can understand. Okay. Unlike me, somebody that starts uh, talking and then stops talking. Okay. Yeah. And now not continuously talks okay. forever. <laughs> <laughs> Some signal that dies off in the end. If you, if you would like to know more about the frequencies. Oh, that's not the between. Yeah. That's not. You fully transform it to get. Or you take the discrete Fourier series, which is also something I don't know. Yeah. But we don't need to waste okay. much time here. Maybe I can explain it for my computer scientists. You okay, tell me. Uh, you can use this in, uh, for example, um, um, computer vision, mm -hmm. um, where you have a picture and you want to transmit. Um, a stack of pictures, which is also called a video. And okay. for compression, yes. you uh, Fourier transform your signal to be very, um, where you, you switch the picture from a 2D space to another space so that it's very compact. And this is what a Fourier transform can do changing the signal to be in a much more compacter dimension so that it can be transmitted in a very efficient way. Just to give you an intuition, what a Fourier transform can do. I know this like from image compression, that yes. you can convert this like into like functional, like a sign space something, yes. then you can reduce the higher frequency yes. and whatever. Yes. Still, like this is very abstract for me. Can, yes. can, can I give a can I give Please. a better example on that? Have Have you ever been to a church? Yes. Good. Was there an organ in there? Yes. Have you ever heard organ music? Yes. Wonderful. Have you ever heard good organ music? Go <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we should go to Leipzig once and really that's jazz. That's no longer organ music there. Um, if it, being a being a bit wrong here, but still being okayish, you know that an organ has a lot of pipes. It does. So it has different tones, mm -hmm. and usually it gives a certain frequency. Let's think that every each of these organ pipes can be described by a single frequency, of a tone of a single frequency. Uh, uh, it emits like a periodic wave. Something, a periodic wave, and it has a certain frequency. So the high tones, they change quite a lot. And the low tones, okay, like this. And so they also can play at different volumes. They can play loud. Or very loud. The amplitude? The amplitude, you know. And playing now a piece of music on this means you're pressing all those buttons at different points in time, sometimes louder, sometimes less loud, and together they form a wonderful piece of music. And if you're a really good organist, you can do anything with that. You can make this organ talk. You can make it sound like somebody's speaking, or you can make it sound like it's raining, or you can make it sound like a stampede of, of wild wild beasts. I see, I see what you're getting at. So the idea is that basically what you're doing here is playing an organ. You're taking something that you want to convey a function with a certain kind of representation. It's, it's sometimes louder, it's sometimes some, some signal. The only thing that we're really saying is in L2, so it dies off in the end and doesn't get to infinity somewhere. Mm -hmm. in between. So this integral stays below infinity. And now what you're doing is these f tilde, mm -hmm. these are the amplitudes of your different buttons. So how, how strongly you press and how strongly one of those organ pipes really goes. While the ends mm -hmm. give you something like a frequency here if the frequency is higher or lower. So you're basically playing all the things at once. You would have an infinite keyboard. Mm -hmm. 
But I tell you, if you press one, th one of these uh, 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 buttons on your, on your organ, if you press it, when you press it, and how strong you press it, to really play that piece of music. And in the end, the sum of all of this, this wonderful music that's coming, that's something like your, your function here. And what Pia was saying is that the whole representation of all of this that you're hearing, which is a very complex piece of music, is encoded in your music sheet. It just tells you when to press what with what with how much power. And that's the very compact representation of this wonderful thing you're hearing in the end. Of course, it's not quite that because the organist can, of course, have some way of interpreting okay, yeah. the music, but that's not in here. We're math, there's no interpretation, it's just done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave you an example. So, and the idea is that a, that a Fourier representation means, and this was the completeness he was referring to. I have all the buttons that are needed to express anything I want. So that means the Fourier series has nothing to do with sines or cosines or any transcendental functions. Yeah. Except that I hear this a lot, like, like you, you, you like compose a signal of sine waves or something, like, like stacked up. It's, it is, so this like Fourier series doesn't imply we have to talk about any periodic signals or something. Like we could use anything as, as base functions. No, that's not entirely true because the base functions we're using are exactly these, and they're just the um, they're just the complex representations of sines and cosines. You saw this neat trick when he got to the zero. Sorry. There. But if you write the Euler formula, then this this here. So. Right. Write down the Euler formula. Yeah. This E I M X. You can also write them as, as combinations of cosines and sines with some i in there. In okay. There. That's due to Mr. Euler and, and or Euler, as we call him, and other people. Yeah, it's Euler's identity. Exactly. So there's this is just this is just the way of, of actually writing all these cosines and sines. So we cannot just choose any functions. There are actually those cosines and sines because only they really fulfill these identities we have been talking about. But usually physicists don't write cosines and sines anymore because they just write this e to the ix for, for reasons of being totally obscure and, and, <laughs> and actually thinking a lot in waves. Yeah. So this like final idea that, that what we what we ended up in the end that that is a Fourier something series of the Fourier approximation. Or we cannot we cannot do this for any set of bases. Uh, you can do it for any base set, but uh, this is mostly the simplest one, and you can interpret it. Uh, uh, what do you mean by base set? So you can if the function is set of bases. But if we take uh, the standard base, what standard? What is, what is the standard base of a function? So the function space, outside of function spaces, just R three. And then it's fine. But we are talking about function spaces. Uh, you this mean a signal, yeah. some signal of any sort, and you can do the Fourier. Is this? Is it that what you mean? No, here is. Or do you mean like right. data? Yes, yeah, just points in image R3, or something. Point, point cloud in R three. Void cloud in R three you can do, but if you would want to relate it to that, the point cloud in R three would, would actually be expressed as a function, or let's put it better as a distribution in R three. That's why I winced at the Kronecker delta, <laughs> because it's the Kronecker delta is one of those very neat old tricks by physicists to convey that we now go to distributions. But that's another thing. So uh, the representation of the data in R3, a point cloud in R3 that you're talking about. I could make up a function mm -hmm. that for any point R in that R3, for any vector in R3, mm -hmm. it gives you 
a one if there is a point or a zero if there is no point. But we need to have functions, so we need to be in a function space. Like this does not hold in other spaces. Uh, what we're talking about here is that if you have a function that goes from minus pi to pi and has the property of, of uh, a finite integral, mm -hmm. then we can use Fourier, um, a, a Fourier base, so a, a lin an, a, an infinite combination, linear combination of these sine and cosine functions with the i mm -hmm. to represent any of this function that has this property. Any. And this wouldn't work in L3 or L17. There would be other. You have other bases there. Yeah. Bases there that okay. are very nice. There are also other, you could also think of other bases for L2. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm just That's trying to cross because we developed the tool here. I can see that yeah. and I figured like, where does this tool apply? And this is one of the one of the things we will talk about later on. What what Max is doing is is something where he prepares a lot of tool mileage uh -huh. to finally show where this is going. And we already talked about this last time. He can't change this style anymore. But usually that's not a very good style for the very first introduction to a to a subject. Because at one point you're just sitting there and thinking, where is this all leading to? Yep. Okay. You know? It's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. But it's a, it's it's usually a way of how somebody who who knows very intricately what is happening and likes the beauty of something, they introduce all the toolage and then in five minutes they fire all their fireworks. You know. The rest is trivial. And if you are by then not very observant or have shut down, then you don't see the beauty at all because you have already overslept the firework. This is why I was saying, guy, you just blew one of your biggest rockets and nobody was paying attention. So if you're doing a firework, at least cry before and firework coming up now. <laughs> but this is kind of an it is this is kind of a pedagogical flaw of presenting it like this. But this is the usual physicist thing. That's why we why after after the fir first three sem semesters. We usually have lost 80% of the students, yes. <laughs> but I think it's the same in machine learning and other subjects. So you usually get taught by somebody who likes everything and also knows everything, just wants to show you the beauty. Yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so you now showed us what, what we have. We yeah, now we had, yeah, we had a nice tool set. We can now represent any function on this small, yeah. Interval on R. So now let's expand this concept a bit. Allow just expand it really short. Let's go from what happens if you go from minus pi to pi. What happens to our base? So if you go to from minus pi to pi to minus infinity, so take the whole R for instance. The main proportion. The main. So all okay. functions, all functions living on R. So you're expanding the interval on the range that was the argument to L2. Yes. yes. So we still have okay. this basis. We still have this, yeah, this, this, this discrete basis. So now, um, if we we have to take now more and more and more and more base vectors into this, but because we don't have a finite. Basically, the actual mathematical intricacies are a lot more complicated, but I just want to give you an intuition now. It's, uh, <laughs> it what don't seem to be many more here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 if we go to the whole R, then, our, then we have to take more and more ends into the equation. So what happens, so what you could do is you go from a, we have to get infinitely, uh, uh, we have to get, um, uh, go from a, um, discrete base set to a so-called continuous base set, where we now, this k now in the exponent can now be any number living in R. 
I absolutely don't get that. Okay, because that you can't get. You can't, can't because get Because previously we had already infinite many bases. But now, but now it's continuous. Now it's continuous. Yes. Before that you could count the number of base vectors because you know the difference between countable and uncountable sets? Yes. yes. So in a countable set you can get a you can uh, assign a natural number to each element the of the set. bijection from the natural numbers. Yes. yes. And now we go to a set where we cannot count the base vectors anymore. And we need that because... How does that improve anything? <laughs> <laughs> this, because we're getting to an FFT here. We're getting to an FFT here, yes. <laughs> We exchange, we go to minus infinity and plus infinity. Now interval, get rid of the natural, uh, of the whole numbered indexes on our base vectors and take a real number instead. So suddenly our um, transformation looks something like this. We take the integral of a is instead of a summing, if you want to represent a function living on the minus infinity plus infinity space, L2 space there. We don't take the sum anymore because we have an, we have an uncountable many base vectors. You, can't, you simply can't argue. Yeah. You just have to I eat that, out. That, part, that, that part you have to eat. That, yeah. <laughs> there, is no, there is no short argument to that thing. No. Yes, there's, this is what, what Max is just saying, if, if we now want to go beyond minus pi to pi, you know, because we might actually want to express a function beyond minus pi to pi, the world is, is a bit larger than minus pi to pi. Fair enough. Um, so a coordinate can go every, from everywhere from minus infinity to infinity. Then the steps to do this include going from the orthonormal base that he just showed you to that one on the right, where you replace the n with the k, and k is, a, is now a real number. And the next thing you do is you replace the sum by an integral from minus infinity to infinity. So for this basis, is it easy to show that this is orthonormal now? Because we used to you have, it's getting harder actually, yeah. because you suddenly don't have this nice integral, you have a distribution yeah. at the end of this. And it's mathematically much more tricky to show. So, so I believe that I'll just tell it to you. Starting with the uh, minus pi to pi example was for mathematical convenience. Yes. Now you're getting to the thing that's yeah. actually useful. Yeah. I extend yes. that. Too. Yeah. Oh, well, already the minus pi to pi is, 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 is extremely I don't useful mean because, more because everything in a potential well can be, can be normalized to be somewhat minus pi to pi, or at least many, many potentials can, can include minus pi to pi. So, 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 so bounded states is already something where you can really work without knowing infinite space. Okay. So just to like digest it for you, we now, if we are going to, a whole, uh, to the whole R, we need a continuous space suddenly. We cannot express everything with the Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on my I'm biting my nails. Yeah. And this comes to actually quantum mechanics. Yeah, yeah. So this is <laughs> right, right next thing you will just come to quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, just just uh, uh, this just a note. This is often called in physics the plane wave base. And um, this is often used in numerics. Um, I can show it at a later point where this becomes useful. Um, okay. but so, so you heard the talk of Attila. I did. Good. And he showed you a lot of these nice videos. And although this might be a little bit unintelligible, we are now really at the frontier in some sense of what Attila is doing. 
Because one of the fundamental problems is here, if you choose one of these bases, like the plane wave base, you can express some of the calculations Attila does very easily. But the other calculations that he needs to simultaneously do in the same system, the same question he's asking, can be much better expressed in another base. We told, we already said there could be another base to L2. Okay. So now he has one system where he would actually need two bases at the same time to describe what he's doing. And this is a highly complex thing to really do because you can either use, choose one of the bases and describe fundamentally very nice one part of the system, but this really sucks at another point. So think of it that maybe this, this infinite series takes only one or two elements in some part of the system he's interested in, but infinitely many parts in another part of the system. So we are really here already at some part where we are at the frontier of research on how to to compute certain properties of real world systems because of that. So all Attila is doing is finding sometimes the right basis that best express what is happening. Actually not even Attila is doing it, but the, but the computing packages he needs and because they can't do it, his, some of these applications actually take ages. Computing this is really HPC frontier work. Yeah, like plotting equations with this is yeah. it, because you're always doing a Fourier transform, Fourier transform, Fourier transform, Fourier transform, and Fourier transform are are fundamentally n squared or n log n in the end. And if you're having a lot of the co coefficients, if you really want to do a lot large Fourier transform with a lot of elements, this this matrix you're computing becomes huge and highly computational intensive and especially also communication intensive mm -hmm. because it's n squared and this is why this becomes com yeah. problematic. So I'm sorry, but just yeah. just going to the computational science part of it. We have to hurry up. Our, we have to hurry up now. Next, uh, I think we use that one over two pi in the. Uh, yes, one, one over yeah. one over two pi. Exactly. Okay, now we have developed all the methods we need now. <laughs> I even know I have. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. Now it's already over again. Thank you very much for Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. But let's get now to real quantum mechanics. And let's do the Schrodinger equation. And first of all, we have to take a quick tour to what classical mechanics does and easing up easing up Newton or like making Newton easier, which uh, uh, we will now look at a quick, really quick for like five minutes at a reformulation of classical mechanics called Hamilton mechanics. If we ever have a retreat, which I would really like to set up at one point, I would take one week to show you how to put this on its head, <laughs> from its head to its feet. <laughs> okay. Um, so our yeah, usual. Really. <laughs> so what you know from school is that if we had some, if we have some point mass m, which is described by a vector in some in some space in the three-dimensional space, uh, a force. Acting on it means, if we say now this is force F, we know that taking the second time derivative of our position vector of this mass is equal to this force F. Don't specify it. This formalism is not very convenient because we have to know all the forces. Uh, we have, it only works in Cartesian coordinates. It's not a real, 
it's not a real well, uh, it's not a real convenient formalism. You see, like for all the engineers, for instance, they have to calculate a lot to see, uh, for instance, the technical mechanics where their forces act on and how everything does. It's not it's a bit of a hassle to work with. But now I want to show you something something easier. So if <laughs> if how we can ease that up a bit, this this whole clunky formalism of drawing forces and know where they where they are going. Okay, so. Under certain, so if we have a force whose so called rotation is zero, so this is the Nabla operator here. It's a vector consisting of just partial derivatives. And that's easier. <laughs> no, no, not yet. Um, Taking the cross product with it, I don't know what's this. How the vector you, product with it. How do you, know you, yeah. Yeah. you said it's a novel operator. Like operators apply are applied to stuff. Yes. So what, what's it applied to? To this vector uh, value function f. But wouldn't you need to write nabla f then? And this is the so-called vector product. There's a cross pro uh, vector product in between. This is the vector product. Yeah, this x here denotes the. Uh, yeah, yeah, but now you have two operators in one function, or uh, one, 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 one operand. What does this mean? This, this, this gives you a, a function again, a vector value function again. This is just okay. He's, he's confused by why there is an x in between. Yeah, this is uh, this is the uh, this is the notation for the cross product. Okay. Uh, for the cross product. Which for me is a binary operator. Which yes. So it means it needs an operand on the left side, but you pass an operator. Maybe Can you pass an operand? Is, the whole thing is an operator. So this thing, of this thing like a vector, do the cross product thing with the components of f, and the whole thing is the operator, which is called rotation. So don't, don't <laughs> okay. So just in a formal way. So the Nabla formal. operator is not an operator; it's a vector. It's a vector. Yeah. So it's an operand. Yeah. Not directly. The Nabla operator is more like a representation of it, like like formal, formal representation. Okay. Yeah, this is. Uh, I can ex can I explain this letter to you in detail? Maybe that's that's because it's, uh, this this expression is just form of just a formal thing. About so this means that our our forces are not curled. In some way that this that they don't have a so-called curl and uh, one of the videos I sent out uh -huh. showed the curl visualized so if you watch that video you will yeah, understand yeah. what this means this, and I this watch the video I don't understand what it means. <laughs> <laughs> okay but um, continue this 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 applies to a lot of forces and if we have those kind of forces uh, acting as we can write a force we can find a, 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 sca a, a scalar value function v out of r, which is just it takes in a vector and puts out a scalar. Okay. You can write, and you can show mathematically that you can express any force then. As simply minus the gradient or of v out of out of this. Uh, there's no x there now. There's no x there. <laughs> this is, yes, but, but, this is, but v is unary, not binary. Yeah, this is simple. This. But here it works. Yeah. Yeah, here not. Not here. This is a vector. This is an operation between two vectors, which outputs a vector, and this is a. Operation between two. This is the inner product. Okay, let, let me show. Let me show so what this. Is. Okay, so this nabla is now a vector. Yes. Yeah, but its components are operators. Yeah. Its components are operators. Yes. Yes. Just let me it's show. A you. vector of operators. Yes. In a certain sense. Yeah. Okay, that's a whole new mathematical identity. Like and, then you, and then you, you use it as a vector. And then you never had a good course in uh, computer geometry. Yeah. It's interesting. I would like to see the script on your. Did you have computational geometry? No. no. I have uh, computer graphics and visions. 
Yeah, then they should actually have. I've seen that. another operator, but usually applied to to, to just one end entity, okay. one one function. And here it's used as an operand to the binary operation, which is weird. Something missing there. Sorry. I think you're calling. Uh, I'm missing. I'm missing the, the computational thing. operator and the mathematical operator and the and he, he calls X the binary operator. Yeah. But it, it's uh, I'm missing the. Uh, yeah, I use the word operator in computer science terms. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, but the, the unit mathematical operator. Yes. So it's like okay, a, which is a different thing. Uh, I don't know. I, mean, I would say slightly different. Okay. Because I'm now just multiplying this vector value quantity with a scalar. I'm not graph. sure that is helping what you're yeah. doing there. Um, okay. I can just try I to was, accept I erase that. Um, I think at this point it doesn't help much. Yeah. Yeah. Just bear with me. I can explain to you later. Okay. But, uh, I promise. Um, what we see here is that we can define a, a scalar valued quantity, which somehow has something to do with the time evolution of the system. Because if I take this gradient of V, I get somehow this force, and the force determines the time evolution of the system. And this is what people were thinking when they thought about mechanics in a different way. And um, to make life easier, what this quantity V is called a potential. It's a scalar quantity that gives, which gradient gives us the forces of the system. And um, in order to determine what a, how a system evolves. We were just talking about this in the car this morning. It has the unit of an energy, this potential, which I just defined before here. This V has a unit of an energy. Um, so we call it the potential energy of the system. If you recall your physics, Mm -hmm. uh, your physics in school, you always had like, for instance, the height energy or something. That's mm -hmm. an instance for potential. It gives you the, it's gradient gives you the force where the force acts on. So now in order to, if we don't, if we don't want to deal with forces and directions and everything, we can actually find a simpler way of doing that. So you know there's something like the kinetic energy. T equals one half the mass of the particle times V squared. What is V? This is the velocity, so it's the first derivative of a position. Just, we just, um, where the, the velocity. And now, if we define um, something called a momentum, P equals M times this here, so M mass times the velocity, which we shall call the momentum, we can express the um, the kinetic energy simply as p squared over 2m of a particle, of a point particle, of a point mass. Right. So we shall now define a function. Well, if we write down the whole energy of a system, a particle, for instance, just a particle moving in space, as a, fun uh, as a function of momentum and position. We simply write down the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. This is now scalable. I will now call, from now on, I will call the position Q. Okay. 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 Please turn to it. We don't need it here. Okay. And just writing down the whole energy, this is called, in case of a 
where we have system is called the Hamilton function. We will never get to canonical yeah. or coordinates. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, sorry, we don't yeah. need it. No, okay. <laughs> Although it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so now we have some, some expression out of the position of a particle and the, um, and the momentum. And now we would, would, would like to know what's the time evolution of the system. And you can show just, this is just writing it down. Um, we get, I don't go into details here at all. And I'm, um, we can show that um, the change in momentum is nothing more than the derivative of this function for the particle. We take the derivative of the Hamilton function to the position of the particle. RT. Limit of H is RT. Oh, oh, yeah. And the um, uh, change in on the velocity of the um, particle is nothing more than the derivative of the Hamilton function to with respect to the momentum of the particle. You have to believe me a bit on that, um, but what, what, what the essential point is here. That we get this, this here recovers our forces. So the, uh, this is a, the first derivative of our momentum. If you look at the definition of our momentum, nothing more than the force. And this gives us the change of the position of the particle. This is how, these are called the canonical equations. And we can determine the time evolution of a system from it. It gives us all the information we need over a system by just knowing the complete the energy of the system. Remember that these dots mean the notations. Same thing. Sorry, yes, it's a curse of curse of uh, it's a no, it's a curse of expertship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what what this makes it really complicated to go yeah. back and see yeah. what people don't know. Yeah. Yes. That yeah. repetition is important. Yes. Don't get nervous. We yeah. still have 20 minutes until Berger or whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So we start, if you know the whole energy of a system, we can determine all the properties we need there, classical mechanics, like uh, what's the velocity and the position of it? But let's all pick on GPU does, for instance, these solving these equations here. Just write the force here. Yeah. F is that, V is that. Force, force is change of momentum over time, and velocity is change of position over time. I know that's not what you want to say, but it uh, conveys some of the yeah. things that you want to express. I know it's not general true, yeah, but it's fine for now since you did not go into canonical coordinates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Let's go down this rabbit hole. So, the, uh, um, so what we take from here is just the uh, total energy of a system determines its time evolution. This is a remarkable sentence. This is an absolute remarkable sentence. This is something that is beautifully unintelligible. Yes, <laughs> and nevertheless true. Think that there are, for example, if you have a power plant, 
you bring in, for example, a coal, coal plant, you bring in energy, in definition of chemical energy, coal, and you burn it, and you may have now using that burning coal to heat up water. So bringing the, the chemical energy into heat energy, and then you and you really you're really cooking that water, and from this water comes hot steam, and you're building a steam machine out of it that now produces by some mechanism electricity. So all the time you have energy changes, and of course this machine is loud and it's hot. And if I now build an unpenetrable dome, like like in like in 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 uh, these nice Soviet exploding uh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl thing, you know, I built something not just around the, the power plant, but also the place where I get, got the the chemical energy from. So the coal as well, and build a large dome around it and count all the different forms of energy and all how they interact. And I just I find a way to to describe this whole power plant simply by a potential. I don't know how to do that actually. But then just because I get this potential, all the information, all the wonderful things that are happening mean that once I know this total energy, I can tell you exactly what's happening. Think about this. The whole, the whole intricate details of what's happening in between are finally in this potential. So this is, can be a very, very, very complicated function. But I don't care because somehow I will find it out. But the interesting thing is I just need the overall energy content, content within that sphere and I'm done. Same thing holds true for the universe in the end, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> and and this, is, this, is, this is so remarkable. Because if you think at the Newtonian way, whatever we did was, I know you're running out of time, but you can't do it anyways until 12, so I'm trying to stop you here, actually. <laughs> um, is that if you look at the Newtonian way, we always talked about forces, gravitation, or pulling you, or hitting you, or whatever. And we don't know where these are coming from. These are arbitrary. So, so we don't know how all of this works together. But Hamilton tells you, I just need to know the complete energy and, I, and all the details are within this potential and everything is set and fixed. And this is, I can't get my head around this. But didn't we describe the potentials as some gradients of forces again? What was it? Yeah, it's the gradient of a force. No, no. So we are uh, the force is the, the gradient, gradient of the potential. So where, where did we have that? Um, that's why he, that's one of the beautiful things that he did not introduce are canonical coordinates. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes it's even hard to construct an, an easy force that describes all. This. Sometimes we, we can't construct all these forces, but it's much easier to construct the overall potential numerically. And these, these canonical equations he showed us is completely equivalent to the Newton formula for the time involvement of the system. This is the whole point. For a closed system. For a closed system, when the total energy is converged. Uh, is converged. Okay. So where are you going with that finally? I think you just want to finally show me the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> <laughs> what has this to do with the Schrodinger equation? Yeah, you are probably asking you that since ten, <laughs> and I'm sorry. Uh, See, so you have really build, been building up tension. Yeah. <laughs> Just be sure about that you want to release all that energy and everybody's yeah. sitting there and saying, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Okay, so as we saw last time, we had a few experiments which Newton and Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism couldn't explain. So on some sunny day, uh, Schrodinger sat down and thought about how to explain all of this. So what we saw on double slits experiment with electrons, for instance, that they, inter that they have interference effects, for instance. And he also, we also saw that there's, there's still classical, uh, like the path, Newtonian paths happening if, uh, if we measure to which slit the particle goes through. So somehow um, Schrodinger wanted a theory where we can, which uh, somehow recovers this Newtonian mechanics or Hamilton mechanics here. So we started out from Hamilton mechanics, which we just saw, writing down a total energy and um, get, getting the trajectories. He wanted to recover that in some sense, which is called the correspondence principle. So um, let's write it down. Um, but he also knew that just knowing the trajectory of a particle and its momentum it doesn't really result in something like an interference pattern in double slits or something like that. So he thought about we need some different dynamical quantity, not any dynamically in the sense that it depends on time. So before that, we had the position of a particle always and its momentum as a dynamical quantities. But now Schrodinger thought that does not cut it anymore. And this was the radical step he took. He said that, um, oops, um, actually historically that's not true. I'm just trying to make it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 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 Uh, dramatic. Just, <laughs> just um, uh, instead of a out of T and some momentum out of T, um, we will now. Um, We say uh, we will now have a uh, we take a new um, dynamical quantity which uh, should be a function psi which takes in uh, point in space, a spatial coordinate, and a time coordinate, uh, and a time coordinate, t, and maps to a complex number. Without a ball. Hmm? The error without the first ball. The, the, the mapping error, this is not, this is the element map. This is without a, uh, you are you okay? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me vigorously. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so have so much more in understanding yeah. how this is going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I try to hold it back. Next slide. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! <laughs> or we also call it the state of the system. Also we either call this function psi here, which we introduce as a new quantity here as a wave, call it the wave function or the state of the system. Mm. You're not? Mm. Mm. Fine, for now. For now, yeah. Um, now the problem is, how do we determine this state psi and how does its time evolution behave? And 
True, and um, you can think about this a lot from when um, looking at wave packets. Wave packets are waves which have, which, which look like this. Um, so you can draw a lot of analogies what happens with, uh, I'm assuming that matter behaves like a massive wave. You can think of, you can think about um, uh, matter certain waves. So like this so can matters, be a wave here. Yep. This has a wavelength, for instance. How? Yeah. Or why? That's uh, a good question. No one knows. No one really knows. Yeah. <laughs> but it is like this. No, no, it is like this. You can, you can measure it. Not for the for the end, but for electrons, for instance. But this is what, what Max said the last time in the very beginning mm -hmm. that electrons have, um, have um, features like waves and particles. Okay, I, I got that. But now he says we can represent any mass as waves. So I figured like yeah, that's any wave. mass includes yes. electrons. Yes, and teapots. Yes. Yes. And you. Of course. Yeah. Okay, um, there's no real good way, in my opinion, to motivate the next step. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, for, for me, it's like, uh, maybe I don't, I still, maybe I don't understand all the motivations to a good extent, but okay, let me start out. We take the Hamilton function of classical mechanics. and do the following. We, instead of writing down um, energy, we introduce an operator. Time operator. It's the first derivative of time. And instead of using the scalar quantity P for the momentum of a particle, we introduce the momentum operator, which ha ha is of the form. Minus I H bar times the nubler operator. And the position of the particle now at the moment, we leave it like that. Okay. What we then end up with, what is H bar? Uh, this is the, uh, this is Planck's constant, uh, well, the reduced Planck's constant. So it's the, uh, so the energy of a wave is uh, nothing more than the Planck constant times its frequency. And if you want to, and H bar is um, the Planck constant, uh, Planck's constant divided by two pi. Out of convenience reasons, because otherwise you would have floating a lot of two pi's in some equations. Yeah. Um, okay, start a new page for this. So what Schrodinger ended up with as an equation This is the Schrödinger equation in <laughs> um, how you would come up with this. Um, so this gives, so looking at this, so this term on the left side somehow um, so, uh, corresponds something 
to uh, is the simply the insertion of the energy operator which we just introduced. And on the right side, this is the um, um, uh, this expression can be further developed or like further written down and simply by um, put um, um, writing out the wave function first. Um, this expression on the right side here, this h bar squared, so this corresponds somehow to a kinetic energy. So this corresponds to the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian, and this to the potential part. This is again the potential which we just saw in the Hamilton equations, the potential energy. And um, this here, expression here on the right says so the so-called Hamilton operator H. So writing, writing down this equation in short, This is the form of the Schrodinger equation. If we know the potential of the system, we can write down the Schrodinger equation immediately because this part of the kinetic energy stays the same for the systems we are looking at always. Okay. That's a lot to take in first. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly we, we changed our we changed our dynamic quantities from a position to a, something that's called a wave function. And we, I haven't specified what the wave function actually is yet. Okay. Um, yeah. You have one minute. <laughs> one minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, watch the rest of the fireworks now. <laughs> I don't know if I blew it too much. Uh, actually, that's a little heavy. Um, I must have missed it. <laughs> so what is Psi actually? So Psi is a complex quantity somehow. And if we think about it, we can't really measure complex quantities in real life, really. If you think about it. So um, you know, complex in the mathematical sense. Like yeah, I like complex in the mathematical sense, yeah. Com Complex numbers. Yes, we are here the center which might define complex. Numbers. Complex, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what you interpret, you cannot interpret psi really, but you can interpret its absolute square. I will point you to a very nice book after you have finished. It would be great. We can um, interpret psi, its absolute square, as a probability density. Um, to find or to measure a particle at a certain volume. So if we have just, for instance, psi out of x squared somewhere here, and we, it, is a, a, it is a probability density of finding, of measuring, if we have a detector somewhere out there which measures a system, where, with which probability can we find the particle at a certain point in space? So now suddenly our well-defined uh, deterministic mechanics somehow ended up 
in something that's fundamentally probabilistic because we don't have anything like a position of a particle anymore. We can just get the probability of measuring it somewhere in space and time. And that's the confusing step or <laughs> that's, 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 that's where everything goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, how are we doing in time at the moment? I think you're done. I'm, I've, I'm, I would say this is a very good place to stop. I would have not even said this one anymore and yeah. kept it for the next time. If you uh, want to do a follow up on that one. Yeah. Um, I, I, would, I would strongly suggest to go for lunch now because it's already 12 and we want to keep it strict to two hours. Just a very tiny feedback again. Um, one, one of the fundamental things that this seminar is about is to convey to others what you're doing and why it's interesting. So in terms of a pedagogical approach, you should not wait too long yeah. to convey why this is interesting. So one of the things that you did here is you tried something that's impossible. That's why you failed. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. Because you have to actually have develop a lot of mathematical tools to rigorously talk about what you want to do. So what you did here was you were talking about vector spaces, inner products, function vector spaces, probability and quasi-probability distributions, complex representations, and finally, Hamiltonian mechanics, all in four hours. Mm. Each of these is a semester course. Yeah. So the first thing you have to do is realize I can't do that. That's important. Yeah. I can't do that. Whatever I do, I will not be able to do that. And this is a very fundamental step in understanding what you want to do. So the first thing you do if you present something like this is to write down your goals. What it is, what is it that I actually want to convey? What do I want people to keep in mind while I'm here? You did a lot of nice stuff, but I personally, even if I knew this background, I would have problems connecting it to the fundamental question you introduced. Why am I talking about waves now? What are these waves? Are these the same waves we have been talking in double slit experiment and so on? By the way, they're not. So the, the point here is, if you do something like this, and this is really, this was way over the head of you because it's the first time you ever did this. And yeah. I, this, this, this sounds like actually, actually a bad revenue, but it's actually, the way you did it was close to perfection. You took the right parts out, you identified the right parts that are technically needed to understand it and tried to put as minimum information as possible in there. So did, you did an excellent job. So you did an excellent job at failing because fundamentally you could not make it. It was impossible. Yeah. Don't, it's not your fault. It was from the beginning impossible to do that, what you wanted to do. And the just very first reason why it was impossible because you chose to do the wrong thing. Yeah. You wanted to enable people to actually somewhat do the math. Yeah. Um, instead of conveying concepts because, and this is one of the wonderful things about quantum mechanics, and this is why it's coming up in popular media again and again and again. Because if you just want to talk in concepts, if, you, if you're talking about quantum mechanics in real life, if you're, have, if you're a science journalist, you will also talk about waves being particles, particles being waves, and things are here and at the other part of the universe at the same time, and the cat is both dead and non-dead. And essentially it's all wrong. 
because you're missing fundamental things that you can best convey in the mathematics. And as a physicist, you know it's wrong. All these partial explanations because they're missing central points that you can only see if you do the math. Now you have two, two possibilities. You create a form of image that conveys the same concepts, but you always say, be careful, that's wrong. Or you go into the math and show what's right. And since you need to go into the math, you need to introduce a lot of concepts unfamiliar to everybody else. And so in this kind of framework, you're failing either or. But now the really interesting question is, and this is why I'm saying it's over your head, because this is now like state of the art. I have given this lecture for 20 years and I finally arrived to perfection in my mind, not, not in the mind of my students, but in my own mind, how to really find the balance between the mathematical approach and the conceptual approach. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's failing. I, I had, I had um, to be honest, this repetition, I had expanded it last week when I got home um, because I wanted to show the autonomous systems for function space. Why do you want to show this? Because this, this is exactly one of the questions. Why do you want to show this? Because write down what you want to show, you know, write down what the final aim is you, of your talk is yeah. compared to what do I want to show in between. Why do everybody sitting here, why do I want to show that this set is also normal? Do I really care? How does yeah. this connect to my final result? You know, it's beautiful exactly. that I, everybody was sitting here and saying, why? Cool, it's also normal. I realized it. But what yeah. is the connection to what you actually want to say? Yeah, you're also calling the seminar the numerical method seminar, and yeah, this is why I wanted to show this concept of automatic. Fine, absolutely yeah. fine. But then you should then you should have said, okay, I'm today in giving you an introduction on vector uh, spaces of functions. Yeah. Totally fine. Yeah. As an, as an, as a as a as a closed seminar. By the way, people, do you actually know that vectors are more than arrows in 3D space and you can do cool things with them? And the motivation would have been very different. Yeah. You know, because everybody's waiting, where's quantum mechanics coming in? While well, just concentrating on saying, by the way, did you know that I can treat vectors as functions? About function as vectors yeah. is something amazing by itself and does not need another motivation yeah so what what one one of my fundamental things is write down what you want to convey in two hours yeah write it as one sentence if all else fails if the computer fails if my handwriting sucks if my video doesn't play whatever if my, my voice stops, whatever. What is the single thing after those two hours that I want everybody to keep in mind? And how do I get there? This is an art form. This is so you did a really, again, saying this, the way you did it was very good from a, a trained yeah. physicist <laughs> perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And it is so hard to get out of this yeah. and tell, tell it to somebody else. Say, look at this, this is this thing, this is that thing. Remember this from your own application. Because you, 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 you're really getting out of your comfort zone and you really did a nice job in, in getting there. But what I did not get is how you wanted to end up with the, with the initial motivation that you gave us. Everybody here was patiently waiting for that. Yeah. That's why I saw you you're building up that part. <laughs> <laughs> How do I set this all together and finally, oh, 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 I'm so satisfied intellectually. And that didn't happen. Yeah. 
that's <laughs> for several reasons and can it can make you a, a yeah. four sheet of why it didn't happen but that's not your fault because your fundamental idea was right but you have to practice on how to get there and also to understand what to leave out what to emphasize how to go over the many obstacles you have in between and whether you really address them or sometimes you're really just even as a as a as a presenter and as a as a professor you just sometimes cheat and you hate that one nosy bastard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I did a very good job. I did the same job in my studies. <laughs> Usually at one point you either get offered a job or set or, or kicked out of the lecture. These are the two options. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly they're happening simultaneously. Um, to actually ask uh, questions Wait, I did not get this because sometimes a professor by default says, I know this is now an intricate thing that needs a full lecture, but I simply don't have the time. So I'm kind of cheating and rumbling over it and give you some kind of metaphor on why this works. And since you're all students and you're not listening anyways, it's going to work. But there's this one student that's just sitting there and saying, wait, what did you do in the last two minutes? Up, in, up until now, I could follow, but now everything is gone. You hate those students, and at the same time, they're the ones that you want for your for your group, because they are the only ones that realized you cheated. So they really understood what was happening up until then. So that's the very first feedback I want to give you. Did yeah. a, you did an amazing job. Thank you very much. Again. Absolute impossible task. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>